Boy, ain't it good to be saved. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's good. Anybody besides me glad you're here? Boy, I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm not going to preach real hard this morning. I'm going to just uh, do a few things here to, and uh, tonight we'll come back, but um, I don't know. I, I preached pretty hard down there this week, and, and man, I'm telling you, it like a blow my throat out and We've got some auctions to do this week and preaching to do, but anyway, why it's okay. I just ask you to pray, but I, I, it wouldn't matter about that anyway. Some of the things I'm going to talk to you this morning about, I just feel like I just need to kind of quietly preach it. But in my, my, Matthew chapter 14, verse number one and two, it says at that time, you know, I'm preaching through the life of John the Baptist, and and we're about done, probably be done with this whole series tonight. But it says at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. And said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. If you look over into Mark chapter 6, the other account of this, and about verse number 14, Mark chapter 6, verse 14, And King Herod (coughs) heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he's talking about hearing about Jesus. And he said that John the Baptist... Let's talk about Herod now. He said, John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or is it one of the prophets? But look at verse, look at verse 16, folks. Now, there's a lot in this verse to learn from here today. But, Herod, but when Herod heard there, he said, Oh, it's John. It's John, whom I beheaded. He's risen from the dead. Now you say, Reggie, what do you get out of that? I, I want to just, for a few moments, we're going to go to something else, but I want to talk about, folks, listen. One of the most dangerous and deadly things you'll ever do is not take care of an, a defiled conscience. Herod's, Herod's conscience was troubling him right here. And I'm going to tell you something. Now you listen to me real good. I've been down the road a little while now. If there's anything in this world that will keep you from having the joy of the Lord, it's your conscience not being clear. Paul said that he exercised himself to have a good and a pure conscience. If I love you people, if I love myself, and if I love the cause of Jesus Christ, I'll encourage you and challenge you that when you have messed up and you've done somebody wrong, You've had a wrong attitude. You've said something wrong. You've done somebody wrong. You need to go back and fix that. You need to clear your conscience. I don't know your hearts any more than sometimes I know my own, but I will say this to you, that God has a way of bringing things to our conscience. And when Jesus Christ was doing these great and mighty works, he couldn't, there was no way he could enjoy that. There was no way he could, let me tell you what else I see from it. It messes your perception up. It messes so much up. You cannot see anything of life like God really wants you to see it. Having your conscience messed up and your conscience defiled will just totally train wreck your life. And I've wondered a lot of times, I've said, Lord, why ain't folks happier than they are? Why ain't folks got more joy of the Lord than they have? And I really believe part of it. Or it could be. And I'll just ask you to do business with God this morning. Is your conscience clear? Are there people you need to go get your conscience clear with? You know, it takes grace to do that, doesn't it? And it takes humility. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. Humble pie, it's pretty good after you eat it. But it ain't so good right then. But it'll be a blessing. You clear your conscience up with people. That's hard to do. Now, here's the thing about it is. Somebody says, Reggie, I tried. A lot of people won't. Let me tell you something. There, uh, <clears throat> there are people who specialize in this. Okay, let, let me explain myself. There are people who specialize in loving to be offended, and you ain't never going to. You ain't never going to fix it between you and them. I didn't say you had to make everything all right between you and them. I said clear your conscience. You clear your conscience. You fix it on your end. If God shows you that you have wronged somebody, fix it with an humble heart. And I'll say this to you, don't expect them to accept it. Don't expect them to receive it. Don't expect them to say, oh, that's lovely. Everything's fine now between us. 
probably not going to do it. God never says that. God says for you to clear your conscience. But here's the thing. Herod could have repented. Herod could have went before the nation and said, I've killed a just and a holy man. He could have said, God, I've sinned. But he wouldn't do it. And because he wouldn't clear his conscience, folks, every time something happened, John the Baptist's head was sitting in front of him on a platter. With blood oozing out of it, his eyes looking at him. I'm telling you something. You will get... You know what? God don't have to torment you. The devil will blackmail you. And when he gets you to do wrong, then he'll tell you don't make it right. And then he'll torment you every night and day with that which you've done wrong. And I just want to encourage you, if you've done somebody wrong today, now let me say this. Sometimes it's hard to see. There may be some of you sitting out there today and say, Reggie, I sure wish you'd practice what you preach. Did you know that right now, as far as I know, in this congregation, I'm sure I've offended you, but if I did, I don't know it. Now, if preaching offended you, that's another thing. I'm not going to apologize for that. If the Bible offended you, I'm not going to apologize. But if I personally offended you, it's good to go get it right. Now, I'm going to give you a little story. It happened between uh, me and Van here just recently, and, and, uh, and just show you that what happens. It's a good illustration, I'm sure. Maybe it's with you guys. Uh, Van called me up here a while back and told me, he said, I've got a tractor and a bush hog. I want to sell the sale you've got up there. And he told me what it was, and I advertised it. And when the sale came, it never showed up. And he never called me. And I had guys come to me at the sale and said, where's this tractor at you advertised, Reggie? He said, well, it didn't show up. Do you know, Kenny, down in my heart, that kind of offended me. I thought the least he could have done is called me and said, Reggie, you know, I just ain't going to be able to get it there. And you know, Van came to me the other day, a few days ago, and he said, Reggie, he said, I, I need to get something straight with you. He said, I was gone, and it never dawned on me. I forgot about it. Never, I never thought about getting that truck. But you know, so in my heart, I knew Van did not maliciously, oh, I really hit old Reggie, good one, boy, I got him. <laughs> no, I knew that. But you know what the devil was doing? You know what the devil was doing, Kenny? He's working that on me. He's working that on me. And particularly one service, the man got up, and I seen him come up here to front of the pulpit. And boy, I tell you what, it's just kind of like the devil said. <laughs> and you'd think, well, Reggie, you shouldn't have. No. But I'm telling you, the devil, but the man had grace. And he came to me, and he said, Reggie, he said, I'll tell you what, I apologize to you. He said, I forgot all about that. You know what? I'm trying to forgive him. <laughs> No, you know, it wasn't very hard to forgive him at all. I mean, really and honestly. Now, in my heart, I knew he didn't mean to do that. But the devil still used it. But you want know Van, listen to me, listen. That's what makes Van a great man. He's my brother, I know him. I don't need you to tell me who he is. Do you think he lowered himself in my eyes? He raised himself in my eyes. I want to encourage you. It may not be, and I sure hope, I think I'm going to run straight to my truck. Boy, I'm afraid somebody might come and say, well, I'll, I think I'll tell you about it now, Reggie. <laughs> Since you asked for it, I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> but the truth about it is, folks, we're all going to get offended. We're all going to get offended, and we're all going to get alert. But you know what? That was just a little situation where the devil was just using a little bore on my brain. just like a little worm in a tree, he just boring it in there. And, try, you know, and boy, just making me think about, you know, and, and is it, but you know what? He cleared it up. And I'd encourage you this morning, uh, I ain't really preaching on this so much, but uh, John the Baptist, oh, 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 Herod, he had a filthy, defiled conscience, bad. And I just want to tell you something, if you've done somebody wrong, get it cleared up. Now, again, I want to emphasize something here today. I've had people <clears throat> who got offended at me. Many. Probably most of you have been at one time or another. But no, seriously, I've had people offended at me. I've got people that's offended at me today. And I've went to people. And But I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something. I have found out. I've got people out there whose spirituality is based on what inconsistencies they can find in my life. That's a flat out truth. I can just tell. Their whole spiritual life is based upon the inconsistencies they can find in Reg Kelly. And if they've got two or three areas of life that they've seen where I've been inconsistent. I had a woman tell me on the phone one day. Used to go to church here. She said, you run my family. 
I said, well, how did I ruin your family? Well, she said, you get up here and preach that your children, you, that the uh, 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 secular colleges was terrible. And said, I didn't let my kids go. And then you wound up letting some of your sons go to a secular college. He said, now my kids will never have the education that they could have. I just like to get a call like that. I'm to blame that her kids are not going to be successful in life. You know, you just, they're just always looking out for consistency, inconsistency. Uh, they, there are just people. And I want to tell you, here's the sad part about it. They get offended, and the devil bores it into them, and then they use it the rest of their life as to why they're not going to go to church anywhere. Why they ain't going to have fellowship with nobody. And uh, the Bible said, great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Now, we ought not to want to offend anybody. But I just want to encourage you today. You know what? I want you happy. You know, I, I, I'd like for my kids to be successful financially, you know, to a certain degree. But what I really want for my kids is for them to be happy. How many, how many parents say, you know what? That's what I want. I want my kids to be, you know, past being saved, I just want to be happy. And I know this, that they cannot be happy with a defiled conscience. So if you, you know, I'm just going to take this deal about uh, uh, Herod here. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, his mind was haunted. He had a haunted mind. Couldn't, you know, things come up, pop up. It just brought it in all the time. And, and I just want to say something to you. Listen, sometimes parents, uh, I, I'll tell you what, I've offended my children. I've had to go to my kids and say, listen, daddy was wrong. In fact, I, I, I personally believe that the, God will put every father through that test. And you better, better listen to Bill here. You know, I ain't done, I've done more things wrong than I've done right, but I'm going to tell you this much. You better be a man enough to say, if God shows you, you better be man enough to go and say, listen, daddy wasn't right. Daddy spoke wrong or daddy thought wrong. Anyway, you may, children, you may need to go, you may have offended your mother and your father. You might need to go and say, Mom, Daddy, I, I've done wrong. I've done wrong. I want to say one thing this morning. Like I said, I don't know where this is headed to. We're, we're heading on down the trail here somehow or another. You know, kids, I want to encourage all of you this morning. And I mean, I, I want to look all of you in the eye. Don't let sin separate you from your mom and daddy. Amen. Don't be doing things that you'd be ashamed of your mom and daddy knowing. I, I'm telling you, your conscience will get defiled. Did you know I was reading yesterday that in Israel, do you know how Israel checks its airports, its main check at airports, what it is? They have people looking in the eyes of the people. They said there is no machine you can make that can tell you what an eye will tell you. And they have Israeli people that are trained to watch the eyes of people when they're asked questions. The questions don't really, the questions aren't the issue. It's the response of the eye. And you know what? If you can't look your mom and dad in the eye real clear, you better get that straightened out. Don't let Satan and sin separate you with a bad conscience from your mom and daddy. Satan will trap you, kids. He'll get you to do it. And then once he's got you to do it, then he'll load that guilt upon you. And say, oh, you couldn't tell mom and daddy about that. You better not let them know. You better hide that. Don't let the devil do that to you. Don't let the devil do that to you. I'm telling you kids, now listen to me, grow good. I want you to be careful about these computers. About these computers. Are you listening to me? There's probably never been a generation that could hide some things from their mom and daddies as easily and get into as much wickedness as fast. As with computers. So, so I want to tell you something. I, I would suggest to you parents, don't have computers some private place in the house. Best place for computers right out there in the living room. Okay? <clears throat> now, go over now. Uh, 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 turn on over to uh, Matthew chapter 14. What time is it? Anybody? Quarter, quarter till 12. Well, we got just about enough time to get out of here by 1 o'clock. Amen.
<laughs> no, I ain't going. I don't think it lasts very long. There's a thing before what you go ahead and uh, go to uh, Matthew chapter 14. Go back to Matthew chapter 14. We'll do it. But there's a couple things I want to say about John the Baptist's death that you need to get a hold of. The silence of the crowd that was at the party. Have you ever thought about? He had all these people there at that party. She comes up, asked for the head of John the Baptist for his old sake and for those present. He did it. And you notice the Bible doesn't record that not one soul in that whole party said, Hey, Herod, that's too far. That's, that's not good. And I, listen, and men, where were some men who stood up and said, We said, Well, Reggie, he was Herod king. He could have their head cut off. <clears throat> There comes time in life where if it means your head, you better stand. Did you know we got laws that you don't leave the scene of an accident? It's not right according, and that, that comes out of the Bible now. That's in the Old Testament. That's, that's statutes and judgments of the Lord. You don't leave the scene of an accident. You don't see something happen and just walk off. You don't walk by somebody getting robbed. You don't walk by somebody getting raped and act like it's none of your business. It is. You are your brother's keeper in that sense. And let me tell you something. When I thought about that, I thought, that's what's wrong right now in this country. We haven't got, we've got people who are sitting by silent. And, you know, and, and, and Brother Maines, Charlie, can you hear me back there? I don't think he can. Can you hear me all right? That's what you, that's, I appreciate it. That's what he was saying. There's something inside him that could not remain silent when babies are being killed. And God help us if we can just sit around and go on to work and it doesn't matter to us. The sin and the filth and the wickedness that's going on around us. Let me tell you something. The mom and daddy that loves you is the mom and daddy who will stand up and say, no, that ain't going on in this house. The daddy that loves you is the daddy who say, listen, that ain't right. We're not putting up with it. And we need to be as citizens, people that stand up and say, this is not right. And I tell you, listen, there's an old time saying silence gives consent. And if you're silent about sin, you have become partaker of that sin. Amen. Now I'm going to throw you something else. I'm going to show you how rotten and corrupt religion is in America. And it was the same way. In John 18, 28, they were get, they, they were, they were, they were, Jesus was, had been brought into the, the court and he had been whipped and he had been scourged and he had had his beard plucked and spit upon and buffeted and scourged. And I mean, more than any man, I mean, they had lit and all of, and he had been falsely accused. All this garbage. And did you know what those rascals, Pharisees said? Did you know the Bible says in that verse that they would not go into the judgment hall because it was the Passover. And they didn't want to defile themselves. Now listen to this. They had just got through committing bribery. They had plotted his murder. They had lied. They had put up false witnesses. They had put him into an unlawful trial. They had put him through scourging and beating. And then made a big deal about we can't go in the judgment hall because it's the Passover and we might defile ourselves. That's the kind of religion going on in America right now. And I tell you, there's some things. This John the Baptist's life is just full of stuff. I mean, just full of life lessons and reality of the way things are. Well, we're going to do this and get out of here. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 14, let's hit it again and we'll go home. We're going to just show you two or three things out here. Now, I'm at the good part of John the Baptist's whole thing. We're past all of his, you know, trials of life and everything. John the Baptist has been beheaded. Now, I'm going to say this. Some of the things that's going to happen here, there, it, I'm not going to say he's dead yet, but he was fiction to be. And um, uh, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 14, look down at verse number 12. Does everybody there say amen? Now, they just got through bringing his head to uh, Herod. Now, watch what happened. His disciples came took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Whoa, that's good. That's really good. This was John the Baptist pallbearers. I want, there's a lesson to learn from John the Baptist pallbearers. Number, I want to ask you something. Who's going, I think, personally, the man, the, those that carry my body at death ought to be those who cared for me while I was living. I want the men who, stood, who, who stand by my casket to be the men who stood by me when I was living. And let me tell you something. 
You may not recognize them, but if you've got some good, godly Christian friends in this church house, you better take care of them. You better value them. And we ought to stand by each other. First of all, these men were brave. These men are brave. He just got through getting his head cut off. John the Baptist. If you affiliated yourself, you know what those guys did? I guarantee you that the servants who were waiting and bringing the grapes and the liquor and all that stuff to the people at the party... When they saw John the Baptist's head come through the door on a charger, and they went back in the kitchen, buddy, it went through the country like a rocket. It went faster in the Internet service that John the Baptist had just been killed. You know what the Bible says? That his disciples came. They walked up to that prison. They didn't say, well, man, we might get our heads cut off if we associate ourselves with John the Baptist. They were brave people. Let me tell you something. This country is going to have to have some brave men, some brave people who's willing to say some tough things. Be brave. Stand by God's man. Stand by God's people. They were brave. Secondly, they were unashamed. They weren't ashamed. Paul talked about Onesiphus. He was not ashamed of my chain. I want to ask you something. Are you ashamed? I, that's, I, I will say this to you. It's pretty hard to go to this church on a regular basis consistently and, uh, and, and, and be ashamed because pretty soon you get tagged. You get identified. Where do you go to church? And it says something. And I want to say to you all this morning, I appreciate the fact. I hope that you're not standing by me. I hope you're standing by your Savior. But I do appreciate the men and the women and the families that have stood by me as a pastor. I know it's not always been easy. But I've seen a lot of people come and go. And I want to encourage you. Right's going to be right when the heads roll. Right's going to be right when you have to bury the corpse and the head's gone. And, and where is God now? Do you ever think those? Do you ever think about those those disciples? Why did God let this happen? Why did God let John the Baptist be headed? Those men were brave. And can I just say something simple? We need some brave men again. We need some brave men. Yesterday, I'm going to tell you something. I preached a message down there at Arkansas this week. I have not preached in probably 25 years. And God put that message on my heart. And I'm telling you what. It, it ripped the carpet up, but you know what? God had ripped me up before I ever got there. And what it's about is fearfulness and being ashamed of Jesus Christ. And I got home, and this is honest truth. Yesterday, a man came to pick up a furnace from Illinois. Illinois. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> it's all right, Don. And that man was out there, and, and, and we lowered the furnace, and he got his chains out, and boy, he started visiting, and just, just a nice guy. But he started cussing, not cussing me, not cussing anybody. He just had a habit of using God's name in vain and using vulgar language. And man, when he started using that language, you know, and he was just being so nice. We just, oh, he was just, ha- he was just having a great time. Boy, he was having a good time. And the Holy Ghost said, you witness that man. He ain't down here for a furnace. He thinks he is. I seen him down here talk to you. If you talk to him. So this is honest truth. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, you know how I'm, I'm thinking, boy, how do I do this? And he's just talking. He's just talking. You know, and, I, and he goes, he, finally, he pulls his truck around by the office. And I'm out there. His wife's with him and his son. Son's grown. And uh, they're talking. And they're just busy. I mean, man, they've got 400 some miles to drive. They're busy. They're going to get on the road, you know, and they're talking. And I kept pressing, Lord, give me, Lord. I, when I, but, I, but the truth about it was, Bill, I was fighting this fearfulness, this you know, how do I do this? How do I break in here? And this fearfulness, I like, I, you know, boy, I don't, I just could not seem to bring myself to just say, wait a minute. And this is on the street. That man shut his door and I still had not witnessed to him. And I just turned around and started walking to the office and I was grieved in my heart. I felt like I'd failed God. And I'll tell you what. But in my heart, I think God knew that I, I, I wanted to. I just couldn't seem to get the right situation. And lo and behold, this is God's truth. Sarah can bear witness to this. I stepped back in that office and walked right over the desk, and he come bolting through the door, and God said, get him. <laughs> and what did he say, Sarah? He, uh, he come out of his truck. I mean, there, anyway, got out of his truck. He, he, oh, you wasn't out there. I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry Sarah wasn't there. You can't witness this. Anyway, she had been there. <laughs> but uh, he come back through the door, and uh, what was it he was wanting? I, I don't even remember what it was he was wanting. Oh, I know what it was. He wanted to know if he could get back to Mountain Grove a better way. <laughs> but anyway, and man, I was like, God said, here's your chance. 
And I walked him back out the truck, told him how to get in. I said, now listen, before y'all go, I got something I need to talk to you about. I said, I don't know anything about you guys' spiritual life, who you, but I said, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ, that he suffered and died on that cross for your sin. He rose from the dead to save you. And I'm telling you something, life's quick and life's brief, and you're all going to be out in eternity for a very long and I appreciate you coming down here, but I want you to be saved if you're not saved. And do you know what God is my witness, that man said? He said, my mama goes to church every Sunday. He said, I used to go. Amen. Now, you know, it didn't lead him to the Lord, nothing like that. But I had a chance. You know what? My conscience was clear before the Lord. My conscience was clear. I promise you today, if that man was in little noise, I'd feel like I had to call him up and write him a letter. I'm just saying this to you, that we need to be a little bit brave. We need to be a little bit courageous. We need to be a little bit unashamed and get the job done. I'd like to have some buddies like John the Baptist had there, amen, who's willing to come up and get your course. Did you know that this happened two other times in the Bible, that when Samson died and pulled that temple down, that there's some men come and got his body? Did you know that when Saul and Jonathan was, was killed and their bodies was nailed up against Beth Shemesh over there, that some of those men came and got their bodies? You know what? I pray to God that I'll be a, a, a friend of you to the day you die. And I pray that we'll stand by each other when our head's been cut off and when we've, when we've been crucified and when we've had hard times and when we've messed up. Let me tell you one reason I love the men of this church so much. The men of this church have stood by me and loved me through my failures, through my faults. I'll tell you something. You appreciate people that does that. Old John the Baptist had some men stood by him. Man, I'll read that scene. Then his disciples came and took up the body. Boy, that's a scene, amen? Hey, some of you want to make movies. How'd make one? You bring into that scene the, the tension and the fear that could have been there to go up and get his body. Did you ever wonder what happened to the head? I don't know. Well, as another thing, they were wise. They were wise. They went and told Jesus. Then I want you to get that song somewhere. Tell it to Jesus. Would you get that ready? Would you come to the pianist? We're going to sing Tell It to Jesus and go home today. I want you to think about it. If you're not careful, you'll miss that little thing in the scripture. You know what they did? They went and told Jesus. Who are they? They were John's disciples. And John was now dead. And they took his body. And they went and told Jesus. You know what? I want to ask you something, Dave. I was thinking about that old song. It says, Van, come on over here if you don't care. What page is it? You're still looking. Somebody finds it. I don't know if it's in that book or not. Is it in that blue book? 433. 433. Take your song book. But if I'm not mistaken, that song, bring that thing on over here, Van. I forgive you. I promise you I did. <laughs> Ain't no telling how many millions of times he's had to forgive me, amen. But it says, listen to this. Who said amen? <laughs> Carol, was that you back there who said amen? <laughs> Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. I guarantee you those old boys was weary and they were heavy hearted. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus. You know what it says? Tell it to Jesus alone. You know, we're not careful. We're telling everybody else. Now, you can tell Reggie and I can say, my, my, my. How many members of Brother Horner down here? My, my, my. That we ought to have the same care one for another. He's saying one of the best things you can hear. says, oh, my goodness. My, my, my. And he said, if you just let folks talk to you for about an hour and pour their heart out and say, my, my, my. <laughs> he said, that's some of the best medicine they'll ever get. Just you just say, Lord, have mercy. My, my, my. But you know what? You need to really tell it to Jesus. It's good to have some friends you can tell, but you, Jesus is a friend that can really hear. And it says, tell it to him alone. Look at verse 2. Do the tears slow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that two man's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus. Verse 3, do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Let me tell you something. Don't you be afraid of what them folks is doing in Washington, D.C. God is still on the throne. 
They're, they're not. Uh, God is not all shook up this morning. He's got them. I promise you. He's got them. Okay? Are you anxious for what shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Verse number four. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. And for Christ's coming kingdom, are you saying? My daddy said to me last night, he said, I just wish the Lord had come back. Sometimes you get to want the Lord to come back. So we're going to stand and sing it today. And if you just want to come to these old prayer benches, let me tell you something right now. These are not altars. They're mourner's benches. Our altar is the cross. Those are mourner's benches. But you can come and tell it to Jesus today. Stand with us as Van leads you in singing today. You have a burden. You have a trial. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving? Overjoyed departed? Tell it to Jesus the Lord.